Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 24. I'm Steve Kwan. I'm Matt Kwan. Welcome, everybody. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent BJJ approach. So we're going to continue talking about instructor-related topics. Today, we want to talk about opening a gym, something that Matt has tremendous amounts of experience with, something that I'm sure a lot of you are probably thinking about doing, but you just don't know if it's the right thing for you. Maybe you're afraid that you don't have what's needed financially or from an experience standpoint. Part of what we're going to do here today is talk about some of our experience on the topic and what you might not be prepared for when you're opening a gym and also how to identify how this would fit into your lifestyle. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people, well, I hope a lot of people get a lot out of this episode. Uh, We've been asked a few times about our thoughts on opening gyms and sort of, you know, what's involved in that. And I know there's a lot of people out there that, you know, are really into jujitsu or they just want to make jujitsu their life. And how can they balance life with jujitsu? And a simple answer is make your job jujitsu. So hopefully there'll be some good information here and, uh, people get some get some good knowledge out of it. Yeah. So we've got a few items that we want to cover here and this is probably going to be something that is going to extend into the next episode as well. Today though we want to talk specifically about topics surrounding opening a gym up for the first time. So opening any small business if you've ever done it before is <clears throat> tremendously intimidating. You know, you have to ask yourself a lot of questions about whether you are committed enough to do this. You have to sort out financially can you do this? What is the impact going to be on yourself and on your family? And also, do you have the experience required to run something like this? And there's also kind of a mental block, right? Any new initiative that is going to change your life in a significant way is going to be scary. And it's scary for a good reason. There's a lot of risk involved in dropping what you're doing and opening a gym. Mm -hmm. So you have to do a lot of ROI analysis to try to figure out if there is enough benefit benefit here for you to do this. It, it really isn't for everyone. Um, I know that a lot of senior belts, you know, they feel that there's, there's a time and there's some pressure that they have to go off and open a gym, but that's not, that's definitely not the case. It really has to be a decision that you make alongside your family and your loved ones. So our focus today is to put forth some questions that you should ask yourself about what, what you need to do if you want to start a gym and also to maybe raise some items that you may or may not have thought of that will be required if you want to start up a gym. Yeah. So first thing, um, I guess the first thing to identify here is how to decide that opening a gym is actually the right decision for you. You know, uh, everyone who's trained for a substantial period of time, surely in the back of their mind has at least considered opening a gym. I mean, I, I know I have, and we've all had to come up with this decision one way or the other. Some of us do, some of us don't. Um, some of us make a decision and then life situations change and then they might inverse that, invert that decision, right? Maybe you don't want to open a gym now, but maybe that becomes more appealing down the road. So Matt, maybe you could lead this off. Uh, what are the things that you really need to think about in order to decide that opening a gym is the right thing for you? Um, so there, you know, you got, you got to think about what your goals are as a, as let's just assume you're a practitioner already, or, or hopefully a higher level, right? Hopefully, hopefully you're not a blue belt that wants to open up a gym unless you live in the Yukon or something where it's, <laughs> it kind of makes sense. But, but if it's local, usually there's going to be competitive gyms. So you got to think, you know, I'm a, uh, at least we were discussing what rank you should be probably around brown belt level, if not black belt level. And, uh, it's important to, to have, at least a brown belt, if ideally a black belt, because people will look at things like that when they decide to join or, you know, when they're comparing different instructors. Um, Especially if your clientele are people who are not super fluent in jujitsu. You know, if you are yeah. not a jujitsu practitioner and you're not familiar with the art, you're going to be really surprised to find out that a brown belt is a really experienced person. You know, people tend to equate jujitsu with other martial arts and they think that oh, a brown belt, that surely can't mean that much. Now, we know it does, but a casual person with no exposure to the art may not see things the same way. So, the optics of having that black belt, if you have it, can really help you along the way. Yeah, I, I opened my gym when I was a brown belt, and definitely once I got my black belt um, last August, it definitely changed a lot for me. Just from a marketing point of view, it looked so much more professional and you know got more leads and more attention just being a black belt. So that definitely helps. But uh, back, back to the question, you know, how do you know if it's right for you? Um, 
we we've discussed before the idea of currency, Steve, and we we tend you know we we got to we got to think um, as people we got to identify different currencies in our life and and decide what is important to us. So, you know, some people they want to they want to work 60, 80 hours a week and they they would just, they're they're trying to become financially as as dominant as they can in the business world and that's totally fine. Um, unfortunately, if you put that much time into something, it leaves you very little time for other things such as exercise, family, you know, free time, hobbies. So, you know, you're making a sacrifice if 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 money is your your uh <laughs> if you think you're going to become rich opening a jiu-jitsu school, you know, you probably need to have a lot of uh, credentials to your name and and, you know, it's going to take a lot of time to build that up. So, uh, I, you know, I never went into it hoping that I would make t- uh, or thinking that I would make tons of money. So um, if if you love jujitsu and specifically if you love teaching jujitsu, I think that uh, opening a school is a really good option for you. And I'm, I'm very, uh, you know, I, I, I've always wanted to teach jujitsu. So it was kind of a no brainer for me. But I know there's a lot of uh, athletes out there who... They just want to win titles, right? And and it might not be necessarily the best option for someone like that, right? Now, when your competition career is over, it's nice to have something in jiu-jitsu that you can fall back on. So I'm I'm lucky in that way that I'm I still try and compete, but I have a business that will support me on the on the back burner. But as well, um, that that is uh, still jiu-jitsu related, right? It's still what I love to do. So uh, deciding that I wanted to make my life full of jujitsu and, and it's a healthy choice and, uh, and make that my job instead of having a nine to five really opened up a lot of things for me. Not only am I now getting paid to exercise, but, uh, you know, I'm, I have so much more time during the day. I can spend time with my family. So my currencies are now, you know, I I'm high in, uh, I have good health. I have good family time. I have downtime. I have lots of sleeping time, which is super important. And when I was doing two jobs, it was, it wasn't that way. So you really got to assess like, what do I want out of this? Is, is teaching jujitsu a passion of mine or am I just you know, do I just want to do jujitsu? Because a lot of people just want to go to the gym, train, and then leave. And that's totally fine. But running a school might not be what you want, really, if you really break down what's important to you. Yeah, you raised a really excellent point, which is that if you want to run a gym, you have to enjoy helping the people around you grow. And not everyone does. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Some people are just yeah. very, very focused on their own goals. But if you want to open a gym, you have to understand that jujitsu is going to become less about you and more about the people who are paying you. And you, if you don't get enjoyment out of <laughs> kind of helping them succeed, then you're going to be in for a pretty miserable yeah. run, right? And I think we've all probably experienced some of these people where, you know, you, you see an, a jujitsu instructor and maybe they're very competent on their own, but they just don't really seem to care about their students. They, the students yeah. are kind of just like an obstacle or a hurdle that they have to deal with. And yeah. you can feel that energy in the gym, right? That That's something that you always want to avoid. So if you, and honestly, I find though that, you know, as you train over the years, as you get more senior, you start to get some enjoyment out of helping the people around you. For I sure. think this is natural of any sort of mentor type role in life. And being a senior belt in jujitsu is no different. So I, I think for a lot of people, that's going to come naturally, but it is a precursor to success here. You have to actually enjoy helping other people. Yeah, and and even you know, just because you're uh, you could be a world champion, you could be a really great competitor, really good at jujitsu. It doesn't mean you're a good instructor as well. So yeah. you have to sort of decide if if the role as an instructor and a business owner is something that you want, and that involves a lot more than just teaching a class. You know, you're the first one there, you're the last one to leave, you're, you have to clean up. Anything behind the scenes on the books is on you. You know, any conflict that happens on the mats is on you. Any, you know, uh, advertising and merchandising, things like that, that's all on you. So it's not just like you're going in and you're being hired to teach, but it's it's truly your baby that you have to be 100% committed to and, and see it through, right? Uh, so another thing to talk about is just like, you know, when, when most of us have careers already and we're doing jujitsu on the side and then we want to transition our career to a gym, which is my experience. So, um, that's some, especially if you're not like, uh, really financially wealthy and you can't just drop, you know, whatever it takes 50 grand or hundred grand or whatever you want to drop on opening a business. Um, it's tough because I knew going into it that I was basically, uh, committing myself to doing two jobs for at least 
three years, right? We'll give or take three years. Um, cooking full time in a career and then deciding, Hey, I want to have a gym, but I know it's not going to be an overnight thing. I know that I'm going to have to grind at this and it's going to be times when I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, I'm going to get run down. I'm going to have not much free time. You know, I'm not going to have a lot of sleeping time. Those are some really tough years and, and you're definitely in for some tough years before you can finally walk away from your uh, nine to five. But then once that happened for me, all of a sudden my life completely changed. So now I'm at a point where I'm basically a stay at home dad during the day. At night I go teach jujitsu and uh, I have oodles of downtime. I have more sleeping time than I've ever had. So my life is truly like a vacation right now. And uh, now that my gym is all set up, it's, you know, it's just wonderful. I just, it just almost runs itself. But there is definitely a lot of work to be done when you're already working a career and then you're trying to transition into something else. Yeah. And something to tie into that is you have to think not just about what you want to do, but about what is responsible and acceptable to the people who depend on you. So especially if you have family, um, you know, especially if you have a spouse or if you, or if you have children, any decision you make to drop everything and start a gym is going to have massive impact on them. So having their buy-in is absolutely, absolutely essential. And by that, that doesn't just mean, well, I don't really want you to do this, but I guess it's okay. I mean, they have to really be on board with this because yeah. starting any new business from the ground up when you're leaving a position of stability, it's going to really rock the boat for your family. You know, financially speaking, you're probably going to be making very little to no money or, be, you know, in most cases, probably money. negative money yeah. for quite a while. It can result in a lot of work. It can put a lot of strain on your family. This is one of the kinds of things that really can like test a marriage, right? If you take, uh, take on something really stressful that can take you away from your family and your family's goals. So, my suggestion whenever you're doing something big like opening a gym or any large life decision, you have to make sure that not only have you are you sure that it's the right thing for you, but you also have to take into account the perspectives of the people around you. And from my mm -hmm. in my mind, the decision really only makes sense if the entire crew is on board with this. Because in a lot of ways, your spouse and your, you know, your family, they're going to be part of your team when you're running a gym. You know, you're, these are people that you're going to be depending on to help around the house or maybe even help out at the gym or with some admin or take the kids sometimes so that you can go off and train, right? The the support network and the family that you have around you need to be on board with this as the right thing for you to do. So it's just something that you really need to make sure that, you know, you've educated your significant other about what this means and what the risks could be and make sure that they support you in this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I I never wanted to be an entrepreneur as a chef growing up. I, I love teaching cooking. I was originally going to be an instructor. Um, but I be like owning a restaurant, you know, I think it's like an 80% of businesses that open in the culinary industry fail in the first year, right? It's just a, it's a crazy amount of turnover. There's so many factors. There's so many expenses and things that you got to worry about so many hours to put in. It's a lot of work and a good chance that you're going under. So, um, I never was interested in having a uh, restaurant, but owning a school became pretty obvious that that was something that I wanted to do because I loved instruction. I love teaching jujitsu. I love doing jujitsu all day. I just wanted to do jujitsu. So I knew that if I had a, if I had another career, if I, I was actually thinking about transitioning into firefighting. And then I realized that firefighting would still leave that empty spot in my life where I'd want to be doing jujitsu all day. So, you know, I knew that, um, that wasn't, that wouldn't have satisfied my needs. It wouldn't have given my life enough meaning where I would have felt like, uh, okay, I, I, I'm never going to regret my decision. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and jujitsu, uh, for me, it, I feel like it truly gives my life meaning. Uh, and you know, sort of what's that book A man's search for meeting by Victory Frankel. Incredible, Incredible book. Incredible Everyone book. should read that book. It's a short read too. Like there's really no excuse not to read it. Very great book on psychology and why, you know, what, how we as humans um, feel fulfilled. And I think a lot of people that are doing a nine to five don't have this. And and when I read this book, I realized like, oh my God, that basically says that the key to happiness is to fill your life with uh, meaning and fulfillment. And, and I realized that having a school and being able to share jujitsu all day is something that gives me that. So I've never been happier. I've never felt mentally healthier or, you know, had more time to be with my family and, and, uh, and, 
and help help people around me than when I do this. So so I think that um, you know kn- knowing what's right for you and knowing what gives your life meaning is. Uh, that's a good indication of whether or not starting a gym is good for you or not. And that's what I'd recommend to anyone working is, you know, if you're going to work because you, you're trying to make a big paycheck, well, you're, there's going to be a lot of sacrifices on you mentally for that. Um, and in terms of your family life, like we discussed, it could suffer pretty good. And like you said, it's a great test of, uh, of your marriage, right? But if, you, if you're at a job every day where it truly doesn't feel like a job, uh, the feeling of that, you know, once you have enough money to support your family and you can you can pay the rent and have food on the table, you're basically on vacation the rest of your life. So this is why uh, this is why I'm so happy with my choice as starting a gym owner. Why I recommend that people choose their careers based on what they love to do, as opposed to you know illusions such as you know I need to be I need to have as much money as I can or you know I need to have the most status as I possibly can um, I think what gives your life meaning is really that'll decide if you if if your goal is to leave a legacy where you want to help people around you learn get better at jiu-jitsu and you love teaching it that's a good sign that that's something you want to do. Yeah. And I mean, I know that we're talking a lot of here about, you know, passion versus wealth. But one thing to point in mind is that, you know, jujitsu does not, is not a guaranteed route to the poorhouse. <laughs> you know, just because you open a gym, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be impoverished. Uh, yeah. You know, we live in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, which in terms of, you know, income generation is kind of one of the worst places in the world to live. W- wages here are notoriously low compared to everywhere else. And the cost of living is skyrocketing. It is so expensive. But even with those problems, I know a lot of people who have managed to live a very comfortable living through running a jiu-jitsu gym. It's not impossible to do. If you can do it in Vancouver, you could do it anywhere. Um, But it is going to be a grind. And a lot of the time, people underestimate how long they're going to be losing money for it. You know, most gyms do not turn a profit within six months. Now, maybe if you live somewhere where the cost of living is super duper reasonable and there's just a massive demand for jujitsu, maybe then you'll be able to make it happen really, really quick. But most people, you know, you got to expect that it could be years before you're making money. And, And that doesn't mean your your income is zero for years. It means you are actively losing money for those years. And that's honestly where a lot of the strain to the family comes into play. Yeah, and a so, lot of stress. Yeah. So this is where you have to really do some accounting to try to figure out how this is going to work. You know, you need to expect that you're going to be just eating losses for a year, two years, three years, five years, maybe. Yeah. I've heard five years is, is a good sort of rule of thumb yeah. for a business before you actually turn a profit. Yeah. And which is, that's a long time. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's part of the reason why it's so important to have your spouse's buy-in or your partner's buy-in because they might be paying the bills for you while you're out there kind of wasting money on your gym, right? It it takes a while to get uh, any business financially stable. But the good news, one thing that jujitsu does have that a lot of businesses don't have is you've got a team of loyal, devoted customers around you, right? Who really are like a family. Uh, You know, if you're buying like a phone or a a VCR or a DVD player or something, you don't really have any loyalty to that kind of product. You're one and done, right? But with jujitsu, if you build a solid gym, you've got a team of people who are going to look after you financially for a long time. So it is painful to get to that point, but it is totally doable. It, it is not such a, a thing that you're go- guaranteed to be poor if you do jujitsu. If you are smart at business, you can absolutely live a pretty good living ha- running a gym. Yeah, it, it took me, I think two and a half years before I finally started really turning a profit. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm still like, my gym doesn't make a ton of money. I'm living comfortably and uh, uh, it's not like I'm rolling in money, but it's doing pretty good. And um, there is, you forget about that initial startup stage when you're in doubt and you're like, you know, is this, is this actually going to work? Like there were times when I'd go into class, it'd be me and Mike Lee, just, just there. No one would come in. And I'm like, God, Mike, we're paying rent here and, and no one's coming in. Like every month we're dipping out of our pockets. But eventually, you know, if, if you're, if you can stick with it and if you like truly believe in what you do, you truly believe in your skills as an instructor and, and your knowledge in jujitsu and you're a good person, you know, you're personable and you, know, and, uh, and you, you know, we're going to talk about networking a little bit later as long as you believe in it and you keep showing up and you keep grinding and you, you know, you, you, you want to see it through, you should be successful. It's, it's the people that, um, 
that kind of start something and then they, they want half quick assets. success. They yeah. want quick success. They want a quick fix. They want they want a half asset something and they and then if it doesn't work, they they quit. That to me was would have been the most tragic thing, right? Like not they say what hell is uh not realizing your greatest ambition, right? Yeah, that's it's like I, you know, I don't actually know who originally started that quote. I, I learned that quote from Frank Muir, but I think he stole it from someone else. But basically, you know, the the um the definition of hell is when you die, you get to meet the person you could have been, right? Exactly. That's an amazing quote. And I and I kind of thought like, well, you know, if I quit now when I was in a career change, uh, I, I have to go back to cooking every day. I have to dream about owning a gym rather than having it, right? And and that's something that really ate at me for a long time. So I, I just kept saying every day I'd go into work and get stressed out at cooking. I'd say to myself, you know what? This is just temporary. This is all going to come to an end one day. Just keep working. And then I go in the next day, I get even more pissed. I'm like, hey, I'm exhausted. I had five hours sleep last night or even less, whatever. I'm going to get this done. I'm going to train and teach tonight. And then and, and it added up for years and years and, and it, uh, it actually it started taking a toll on my body physically um and that's actually what kind of killed my culinary career is i started having these these health issues due to lack of sleep and a lot of stress and wanting to compete and wanting to push my body on the mats but not having the the recovery time um but i kept my mind to it i kept i, kept, I never lost track of that goal and then eventually i was able to just walk away and I had set myself up in such a way that I was able to walk away from cooking in the business. Uh, I basically just quit my job and, and the gym was in a great position to where it was. And now, now, you know, I basically, you know, I work three hours a day. So it's, uh, it's kind of like that book, what is it, the four hour, eight hour, the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss. I mean, it's I, how, how repeatable that actually is. I don't really know, but it's a really mm -hmm. interesting book that kind of opens up your mind to how life could be. You know, you're, yeah. you don't have to live your life chained to someone else's desk. Exactly. Uh, or even if you do not, you know, want to work at someone else's company, even if you don't have the desire to start your own business, there are ways to structure your life so that you can live the way that you want while working at someone else's business. It really, it, it, it's a good book for kind of opening your mind to the possibilities as to what work can look like and how you can actually yeah. get joy out of work rather than, you know, work being this thing you do so you can live the rest of your life. Yeah. Like what, when I first started cooking, I just, you're, you're conditioned to very rigorous, hard physical work and extreme organization and stress. And after a while, and I saw this with people that I'd work with, it's just, you almost accept that this is what life is. You almost yeah. accept that I have to work so many hours a day. I have to work harder than everyone else. I have to, you know, I have to do this. I have to do this. And then, and then I, when I quit my job, I actually realized I'm like, Oh my God, like I've been looking at life totally different. I could actually have a job that I love to do, that I look forward to doing, that saves me tons of time and I still get to do what I love. And honestly, that's all based around the idea of of uh, trying to base your career around your passion rather than, you know, something else that you feel you have to do when really you don't have to, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you that are thinking about transitioning and opening a gym, you know, it's, it's possible. You just, it's just one of those things you have to really believe in yourself and believe in your abilities and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely doable. Yeah. You know, I didn't think that this episode was going to be one where we would have a lot of like actual mental models to talk about. I thought this was going to be mostly just talking about personal experience, but there are some callbacks to things that we've talked about earlier. You know, we talked about how if you want to succeed over the long term, you have to get rid of the desire to see results immediately and you have to focus on building and executing good habits. You basically have to prioritize the management of habits over the desire to see results. And this is true if you want to be a good competitive athlete. It's true if you want to lose a lot of weight. It's also true if you want to start a business. You know, if you're going to see a lot of red on <laughs> on your uh, you know on your income statement for yeah. quite a while and if that is psychologically demoralizing to you to the point where you're going to quit, then running a gym might not be for you. But if you can prioritize creating those good business habits, you know, basically making sure you're doing things the right way, then that loss is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And then one day you will be making money. It's just a matter of being willing to... Um, you know, put aside the desire to see immediate results and focus on building good habits every day that make your business a bit better. 
Uh, another thing that you know I, I can talk about from a, a personal standpoint, not so much in terms of what to do when you're opening a gym, but just in terms of making big life decisions. Um, an another mental model that we have not really talked about on this podcast before, but I think everyone has probably heard of it, is something called loss aversion, where basically this is a psychological principle where um, losing something is more painful to humans than an equivalent gain. So the, the common example is if I tell you, for example, that I'm going to give you 50 bucks, you're probably going to be reasonably happy about that. But if I tell you that I'm, you're going to lose 50 bucks, you're going to be disproportionately upset about <laughs> that, right? Um, this is, it's a, a common psychological principle and it is important because it prevents people from making big changes that might actually benefit them at the end of the day. Like a big thing is a lot of people just don't quit that job that they hate yes. because they're afraid of what could go wrong. They're afraid that, you know, they might never get that great job again. They're afraid that the new job that they're looking at might actually be worse. You know, they don't want to give up seniority or they don't, you know, they're worried that maybe if they get out of this job, they'll never, and something goes wrong, they'll, they'll get fired and they'll never get a good job again. And that kind of uh, loss aversion thinking prevents people from taking the kind of risks that make life better. Yes. Um, and, you know, if you want to open a business, this is a mental hurdle that every business owner needs to decide if they can overcome. Um, if you need to understand that the way you're thinking about what do I have to to lose, you're probably overinflating what you actually have to lose. Like if you, you know, yeah, if you quit your job and you go to start your gym, like what's what's really the worst case scenario that can happen? Like odds are, you know, you, you might lose money for a, a year or two, but worst case scenario, you, in most fields, you can probably go back into the field that you are in, maybe even at the same company, right? Yeah. As long as you don't just burn your bridges on the way out. So the actual risk is probably not as high as you think it is. But you just need to make sure that you think it through and that financially this situation is workable and survivable for you. That's the big thing, right? You need to do the math and make sure that you, you know, worst case scenario, you can still pay the bills for the next few years. Yeah, it almost reminds me of what's investing. Investing, investing in loss, loss in is, a lot of ways. Which yeah. is a mental model on the database. Um yeah, great, great point, Steve. Like, like sometimes, uh, even like the biggest changes in your life. Like, I, I've been, I've been fired at a job before, and it was one of the greatest things that happened because the next place I worked out, I met so many great people, and you know, these doors open up when you think that something negative happens in your life. All of a sudden, it takes you in another direction, right? So, um, definitely, you're, you're on. I think you're definitely on the right track when you say do the, do the due diligence of calculating if you can survive, right? If you can cover your, your, uh, your food costs for you. And your family and you can keep a, a roof over your head you know if you can afford that and still take a risk sometimes that's one of the you know one of the best things you can do and you're extra motivated too mm -hmm. uh you know if if you're if you need to eat and you're you need to see something succeed such as i did because i had a kid on the way when i started uh really being serious with my school and i wanted to quit my job then it really motivates you to yeah. to do to do to be your best right and and that's where you can really shine because um there's no greater motivation than you know your your child relying upon you right so so definitely um i i looked at it this way for for years after i started my business i would look at you know how much money i owe my the rent how much money i'm I'm, I owe all the hidden fees and how little money I'm taking in. And, you know, every month you look at your statement and you can look at it two ways. You can look at it as, uh, you know, man, I'm, this is just not working. I'm not making the money. And if you, if you have that mindset, you're already thinking negatively. Yeah, yeah. You're already leading yourself down a path of doubt, denial, uh, eventually regret probably. Whereas if you look at your, if you look at your statement and you say, Okay, it's a little bit better than last month or you know what I can still I can still feed my family I can you know I'm not it, it's different if you if you're getting evicted that's yeah. different if, if, if you literally can't afford food that's different yeah but that, if, that's a completely different scenario it's like, a totally different scenario. Th this whole decision process only makes sense to the point where you can actually technically survive right exactly if, it, if you like literally are going to starve and your family is going to starve then that's a different situation that's a different thing get yourself in order work your job a little bit longer right mm -hmm. and, and and you know you might not be able to quit your job that's what i had to do i had to take 
two jobs, right? I had to open my business and do both. Yeah. There are that strategies. That takes a lot out of you. Yeah, and we can talk about this. There are strategies for opening a gym when you cannot afford to quit your job. Like you can kind of ease into it. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, the important thing is you want to make sure that you can, you and your family can survive if you make this decision, you mm-hmm. know? And you've got to be willing to understand that there, you know, there will be losses. It's just a matter of whether those losses are something that you can live with and recover from. Um, yes. You know, on the topic of loss aversion, this hey, one of the frustrating things that people always, you know, always bring up is like, why is it that the rich get so much richer and the poor stay poor? Um, and a big part of that, you know, it it has to do a lot with um, compounding success and it has to do with loss aversion. Um, one of the things that is primarily different in terms of people who are, are wealthy is they can afford to lose a lot of money. They're trained um, by their family and their friends as to how to invest. And so they don't really necessarily have a problem with investing in things. And that, that could be, you know, buying stock or whatever, but could also be investing in a business. Whereas people who have more of a, like a scarcity mindset, they're afraid of what they could lose. They're afraid of loss aversion. So rather than taking their money and investing in it, they hoard it. And the problem is if you hoard stuff, it doesn't grow. Yeah. You gotta, Um, you gotta spend money to make money. Yeah. So, I mean, I know that that's a cliche, but it's absolutely true. So you, in order to kind of overcome loss aversion, uh, you need to have that abundance mindset. Now that that's not to say that you need to take stupid mistakes um, or make stupid mistakes, but you need to understand that opening a business is an investment and that investments can be scary, but as long as you've done your diligence and you believe in what you're doing and you're willing to work hard, you're probably going to wind up better off at the end of the day than if you didn't. And the downside, if things go sideways, is probably not as terrible as you imagined it would be. Mm-hmm. And and a huge motivator for me was I don't want to cook anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like if you really hate the job you're at, first of all, if you hate the job you're at now, now I see so much clearer, get the hell out of that job, do something else. I, yeah. I mean, but if you're, if you're at a job that you don't like and you're trying to open up a side business, such as opening a school, there will be no greater motivation for you than going into work every day and realizing how much you don't want to be there. Yeah. How much, like for me, I was, I was working full time in the kitchen that I was just like, man, all these guys that I'm going to be competing against against a lot of them just do jujitsu all day and I'm mm-hmm. sacrificing a good, you know, a third of my day to get to and from work and grind it out. And then I go home exhausted. Then it's right off to training or whatever. Right. So, um, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's exhausting. And, um, having that motivation of a place that you don't want to go to anymore sometimes can really give you a kick in the ass. But like we said, as long as you can afford food and shelter for you and your family, you know, sometimes risks are some of the best things that can happen to you. And I've seen a lot of people that I've worked with that were afraid to take risks. They were just stuck in routines, right? Like that, the routine of a nine to five and you don't think that you can really escape it. Mm-hmm. Right? It's almost yeah. like a, it's like a subconscious prison almost where you feel like you have to go there and you know, it's the only way I can generate money to feed my family. But in reality, there's many opportunities out there. It's just mm-hmm. a matter of creating that opportunity. And for me, it was doing something that I love. So, yeah. um, you know, we, we, we all, we discussed if you're, if you have, if you're good at teaching, if you're knowledgeable in jujitsu, if you're a good person and you're hardworking, there's, those are kind of all the key ingredients to having a business in jujitsu one day. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a question, Matt, on that topic. Um, competition record. You know, I know a lot of people think that this is crucial to yeah. running, to starting your own gym. Like a lot of people think that, you know, aside from having, uh, you know, a high ranking belt, like a black belt, having a solid competition record is super critical. I'm curious to get your thoughts on this and in terms of, you know, how relevant that really is to wanting to start your own gym and how much of a difference that's actually going to make. So here's what I'll say. I'll say this. Um, not all competitors are great instructors as we discussed. So you could be a world champion black belt, but not have great teaching skills. You know, a lot of them do. And usually you acquire those teaching skills as you progress, but not all instructors are the same. So, um, I will say that being a competitor has really helped me with my gym because, um, and I didn't realize when I was competing because I never, I didn't think that I wanted to own a business when I was blue belt, purple belt, what round later on in purple, I started realizing like, okay, maybe this is something I should be doing because I'm enjoying it so much. But, um, when, when I started competing at white belt, I was basically, uh, accumulating like a portfolio with my competition records. And I didn't even realize it at the time. Now I look at a wall full of medals and I'm like, Oh yeah, like that was a good thing that I, I did all those competitions because I get a lot of leads because 
Uh, I'm known as a competitor. I, I, there's a lot of footage of me competing and, you know, I, I advertise myself in such a way. So it's definitely, as a gym owner, really helped me out. Now, that being said, I've never won a major title. I've never won an, uh, an ADCC or even an ADCC trials. I've never won um, uh, an IBJJF gold. I've, you know, um, I've, I've won tons of provincial championships and tons of Naga championships and, you know, super fights and stuff, but never at the highest level have I won. Yet, I have a great reputation as a competitor and people want to train with me. So... It's funny, you don't need to have the highest level of a credential to attract leads. Like I I have friends that, you know, they're, they're, they're run gyms and they're like, oh, I'm going down to the worlds. I, I got to get that medal for the, for the prestige, for the prestige. And, I, and I'm like, well, is that really going to like help you too much really? Like, you, you know, this say that one, this person lives in Kelowna, you know, people are already going to be attracted to you because they know who you are. You're a competitor, right? Um, if you were in a town like LA and there's ton, you're surrounded by gyms that are ran by world, you know world champion black belts, then it might make a difference. Mm -hmm. But it it might not necessarily make that big of a difference depending if you win these big tournaments or not. You know, like if you win ADCC or you win the worlds or something at black belt, yeah, that's a pretty prestigious thing that could help your business. But if I win, if I win, uh, you know, pans at purple or something, and I'm a gym owner or, or even at brown probably not going to even experience that many lead growth from or that that much lead growth from that credential. Mm -hmm. So but then again, I know people who own gyms that have never competed and uh it reflects. Like people don't seek that person out to to go train mm -hmm. with them necessarily because they just don't have fight experience so um well it could also be too that they don't have the network as well right because like what you're saying is that the opportunity to go out and compete is an opportunity to go out there and you know they the, the resume building equivalent i guess is you know you're getting work experience and exactly by, what it is by getting out there and getting that experience and getting your name out there you're going to have a larger rolodex than someone who kind of stays off the grid yeah and i i never even thought about it when i was competing but like when i was when i was a brown belt competing really regularly i would have people come up to me at tournaments and be like hey i'm a fan or hey me and my kids watch you on youtube and stuff i'm like really like holy crap really like you're a fan of me that's weird because i'm not i'm not even close to being like uh you know even at the most elite level like i'm not i'm nowhere near those guys yet these people that are on the local scene are seeking me out they want to train with me they want to do privates with me and it's because i showed up at tournaments and competed and i was nice to people and i started networking with people so and also because you're a world famous internet podcaster that's right yeah no no it's <laughs> probably more likely that i was uh they were more impressed that i was a chef than anything but um but yeah uh you know when you show up at tournaments and you compete um, it helps a lot. It, it does help you, especially if you're trying to build a brand as a, a gym owner or, a, you know, a jiu-jitsu competitor who is trying to open a school. It definitely helps. And I didn't realize that at first, but now that I look back on it, it's like, yeah, yeah it definitely helped me because so many people come and visit me because of my competition yeah. records. But I think it's a good point, too, that you mentioned where you don't necessarily need to be the absolute best in the world. Mm -hmm. There's When it comes to instruction, there's, you know, first of all, whether... Uh, your ability as an instructor is really correlated to your competition record. I'm not even so convinced. But on top of that, there's there's a degree of diminishing returns, right? You might think that if I want to open a gym, I've got to be the absolute best in the area. I've got to be a world champion or else I'm going to fail. That's probably not true for two reasons. First reason is because anyone who's spent time as an instructor knows that you don't need to know everything. You just need to know a little bit more than the people you're teaching and be willing to impart that knowledge to them, right? You know, you don't you don't need to be the, the master oracle of all, all knowledge. You just need to know, have a few things that you can communicate to the other person to help them get better. Um, on top of that, another thing that you have to bear in mind is most of the people who walk off the street to learn jiu-jitsu are probably doing so because they like heard about it through the UFC and they probably have no idea what ADCC is. Exactly. <laughs> like, I certainly had no clue what that was until I started jiu-jitsu. So a lot of these things might have greater meaning to people who have already been training and they're interested yeah. in... Uh, or competitors. Yeah, they're interested in a, a 
competition gym. But if you're targeting like a casual market or a family market, the requirements for the role and the things that people care about might be significantly different. So that's something to think about. Like your gym has the name Gracie in it? <laughs> well, or your last name well, is Gracie? Well, maybe, right? I mean, <laughs> but, but actually that's a good question, Matt. You know, not all gyms target the same audiences. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on targeting an audience here? Like what are the different options here and what are kind of the pros and cons of each? Yeah, so so definitely it, if you're going to start a gym, you kind of it's it's important for any business that you know what your audience is. Um and it took me a while to to figure out what the the identity of On Guard was going to be. Um you know, there's a lot of gyms that make tons of money catering to kids and family and and women's only classes and things like that. And then there's gyms that are more competitive, you know, uh, co-ed classes. Um more of an emphasis on a, a higher standard, tougher training and competition training. So each ones have their, their strengths and their weaknesses and each ones will attract different people. And that's just the truth, right? Um, for me, my goal was always quality. The standard of, of jujitsu had to be really high. And that's because Rob, uh, from the island, sort of instilled that high standards are, are the way to, to go. Just like I would never pick a career upon, wanting to make tons of money. I'm not going to base the the business plan of my gym based on me trying to get as much money as possible. It's based on uh, trying to pass the best jujitsu that I can and and uh, offering something that other people don't. So And, mm. and I think that uh, I have that at my school because um, there's n no other school in the area that teaches leg locks the way we do. There's no other school in the area that teaches alignment the way we do. The concepts of, of uh, the jujitsu th that we use it's you're only going to get it at my school and Rob's and um, you know and I'm, I'm very confident in saying that so I know that we offer something that other places don't uh, and then you realize sort of okay well am I going to cater more to bu building a business based on kids coming in or do I do I want to have uh, you know a strong adults program where I'm building them funny story actually the way that that way that my business plan sort of came about was that we were we were uh we were we first started renting out the gym at, at a taekwondo school and because of the um conflicting how should i put this the conflicting uh business models where i wanted to have a kids program but they you know in order for me to use their space i thought you were going to say because my martial art is legit and theirs wasn't oh god no i, would, I wouldn't say that <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you guys draw your own conclusions. I'm sure there's only jujitsu people listening here. And, and you know. But anyways, what I was going to say is, um, you know, Taekwondo tends to cater a lot to kids. So mm -hmm. these parents would be coming up to me and they'd be saying, oh, you know, my, should my kid be learning jujitsu? And I'm like, well... I can't teach it here because it's a conflict of interest for the person that I'm renting the mats from. So I, I wasn't allowed to have a, a kids program where I first opened up. So as a result, I had to put all of my focus into my adult program. Mm -hmm. It was a negative thing at first because I was losing a lot of money that I could have had if I had just started a kids program right away. But in the end, it's a positive thing because now I have a room full of, of higher level guys and the standard is uh, it, it's based more around the um, growth and the uh, development of the adults in my program. So as a negative, I lost a little bit of time building my kids program, but as a positive, I have higher level adults. I have, I'm, my gym is known as more of a, a gym that caters to the adult program and guys that are trying to achieve a higher level. So, uh, you know, pros and cons of either and both very different audiences that they're, you're, you know, that I could be catering to, but but in the end, I'm happier with this because as a competitor, it means that I have harder roles. It means that I have harder training now because I've I've sort of structured it in such a way that the adults are the emphasis and the kids are, um, you know, we're still growing the kids program, but uh, definitely the emphasis is on the adults. Yeah, that's actually a really, really great story and a, a great illustration of how important it is in any area of life to really find your niche. Like you, you might not be a world champion, but everyone has something that they can do in a certain way that no one else can do as well as they can. Everyone has a way that they can give back to the community and deliver value. 
a lot of people don't think they do, but that just means that you haven't figured it out yet. Uh, I suggest that everyone sit down and as a mental exercise at some point in their life, put some thought into this, especially if you're planning to ever start your own business. Because one of the things that's so critical to getting a business off the ground is establishing a toehold. Like you've got to, you can't just walk it into some, a new situation and take over the world right away. You've got to have a niche where even though you're small and you don't have a track record, you're objectively better than the people around you uh, just because you've targeted things that way and then you expand from there. And a good example in the business world is Facebook. Um, you know, Facebook now, it's, it's hard to even imagine this because like one in three people on the planet use their services. But back when Facebook started, they were like a small little tool for universities. And their, tar their strategy was they targeted universities in one specific area area of the world and tried to make the tool so cool and so usable and get everyone on board to the point where this whole group became dependent on that tool and suddenly the whole universities got it. And then from there, they branched out to the surrounding universities. And then from there, they got bigger and bigger. And then one day, it wasn't even about universities anymore. It was just a tool that anyone could use. And then they bought Instagram and all of this other stuff. But it the important thing is all of that crazy growth came about because they took a first step where they could deliver value in a way that no one else was targeting. They were building a social tool for universities. Um, and, you know, everyone has some ability to deliver value in that way. Like, it, I mean, in our case, um, not in addition to the school that you run, Matt, and your style of teaching, I'm not really aware of anyone else who teaches jujitsu in the way that we do. You know, we're basically talking about principles and strategies that people use in computer science and investment banking and we're applying them to pajama fighting right like that's a very unusual but useful way of teaching that people haven't brought to jujitsu at least until we started doing it as far as i'm aware so everyone has some unique way that they can think about things and i think getting your first traction in any business it, it's critical to identify what that is that's going to be a big part of your strategy for getting off the ground yeah you definitely need to see like what your strengths are and how you can make those strengths visible and how you can exploit those strengths and make that uh like you said your niche right it's you'd, the last thing i wanted to be was like a you know vanilla type jujitsu school where i'm just bringing kids as in. opposed to like a nutella jujitsu fighter or yeah no no what nutella. is the difference exactly between a vanilla jujitsu fighter <laughs> and a nutella jujitsu fighter no I, I just um you know, like if you have skills and you have knowledge and you, you really have a desire to deliver that to people. And you're, like I said, I always say you're, if you're a good person and you're, you know, you're fun to be around, then the people will be drawn to it as long as you can offer it. Um, there's a lot of instruction instructors out there that are only so, so, or, you know, they don't have a great way of, uh, maybe they may not even be great instructors. So it's important to, to try and find your way to stand out. And I feel like, you know, T training under Rob and learning the way that not only the way that he teaches jujitsu, but um, just the concepts in general that the systems that he uses are really giving me great tools. So thank you, Rob. Got to got to fillet him a little bit on this. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Mm. Got it. Cool. Um, in terms of other things then that we can we can talk about, we're getting kind of close to the end here. Um, something that we wanted to bring up was hidden costs. So mm -hmm. there, are, there are the costs that you expect, like having to pay the rent. But whenever you get any business off the ground, there are going to be a bunch of things that eat into your pocketbook mm -hmm. in ways that you don't expect. Mm -hmm. And it's probably good to at least have some idea of what those are going to be beforehand. Um, Matt, maybe this is something that you could talk about a bit because this mm -hmm. is an area where you've already been through this. Yeah. So, you know, I guess the first thing is you got to find a space, right? And that can be really challenging because if you just go right into like a three year, or a, God forbid, a five year lease where you don't have any students and you're taking on this lease, it really is sink or swim, right? And if you sink, it's going to be really hard. So um, my recommendation is trying to find a community center or uh, a, an athletic facility that will allow you to rent space from them. Um, it's not going to be the most cost effective thing, but it will be cheaper than signing a, a lease that you're tied to. So in my case, we paid month to month at this Taekwondo gym. 
it wasn't super cheap, but it was affordable and it got us to the point where we got maybe like 30, 40 students and it was time to start thinking about moving out. So, And that's a great way to scale up a business, right? Especially if you're worried that the costs are going to be overwhelming. You know, you're not necessarily required to go out there and get a lease and lock yourself in and build the thing from the ground oh, up. Oh God, no. Yeah, you. I know a lot of gyms that are now very, very large that started out basically running out of like a Taekwondo or a Kung Fu gym or something, right? And in the Vancouver area, I can think of at least three major gyms that started off piggybacking on top of someone else's facility before they eventually branched out and bought their own once they hit that point. So if you're concerned about cost management um, and, and also about how much time you can commit, running like a part-time gym out of someone else's space is a super viable option. Yeah. Like, take say if you wanted to start a restaurant, right? Think about all the expenses that go into that. I mean, you got to Assuming that you don't need to do renovations, which you will need to do, you got to have the cost of table, cutlery, uh, linens, perishable food, f- uh, equipment, staff, front of the house staff. Like it's just it's it's astronomical, and also like I said, perishable items. There's tons of products being moved through there that are really expensive. So uh, the <laughs> it it takes so much more to start a restaurant. Whereas if you start a gym, as if you get a space and you have mats, you're basically good to go, right? So so that was one thing is I knew that once I found a space and I could pay off my mats, uh, the the cost to maintain that would only be basically rent and insurance. And, mm-hmm. and you know, those are th- th- that's so much easier to manage than, say, a restaurant where you have people you depend on to keep the business running. You have constant food items coming in that are going bad. And, you know, it's a, con- a whole logistics layer that you've got to worry about. Oh, right? God, it's, it's a nightmare. So that's why I never wanted to have a restaurant. But then I thought, like, well, if I have a gym, as long as I can... And just afford rent and afford my mats it's basically it's almost done right so you know you're gonna have to pay for your mats you're gonna have to pay the uh, the city to have a business license you're gonna need to pay for insurance and your power and all those utilities and then after that it's basically you know those are the bare bones costs that's that's it there's obviously other costs on top of it such as advertising and uh you know do you want to have merchandise and things like that and we'll probably do a, a whole episode just on how to grow things once you've kind of got the ground floor established. Yeah, I, I, we were thinking about maybe combining the episode, but I mean, we've gone off into tangents today, so we'll definitely do a, a second part about maintaining and growing your gym. Um, but this is, you know, as, as if you can pay off your mats and pay off the rent and your utilities and your insurance, then that's basically all you need to start. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd say... For mats, for me to start up my gym, I'm just thinking right now, you know, probably the mats probably cost me around 10 grand, maybe, maybe even a little bit more now that I think about it. Plus I threw a tarp on top, you know, let's say for mats all in, including wall mats, about 20 grand. And then, uh, you know, your insurance is, is probably just over a grand a year, depending on the size of the, of the operation. Plus, you're going to have to pay for your utilities and stuff. So that's going to be probably, depending on where you live, around two grand a month if it's a small space. So, you know, you're looking at at least you'd want to have 30 grand to sink into a business, I'd say, before you you can really commit to something like that or before it's worth taking a risk, right? <laughs> um, and that's, you know, hopefully you, you have something going on the side that can sort of supplement your, your income as well. But you know, it takes around 20 to 30 grand, I'd say, on a small scale operation such as mine. And then once it's all up and running, you know, you got now now comes the, you know, you got to focus on generating leads. So you're probably going to have to spend a few grand on, you know, signage, uh, just think, the, you know, you know, visual things for people to see on your school. You want to have uh, you want to have signage outside. You want to have advertisements that are going to generate leads. And we're going to talk about that in the next episode or whatever. But it's a. Uh, you know, that's that's pretty much the basic cost that I went through starting my school. Yeah, and it's also worth noting that you probably want to keep some cash aside just as an emergency fund in case something goes wrong, because something inevitably will, you know, there could be a big flood, could be a massive power outage, all sorts of weird things could happen that force you to drop a lot of money really, really quickly. So you will always want to plan for that worst case scenario and make sure that you don't get hung when that happens, right? Yeah, and 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 also, sorry, my my experience, I was lucky enough to already have a bathroom and a shower made, so I didn't have to do that. If you need to build a bathroom and a shower, that could cost you 10, 20 grand right there. So, you know, if you're going to And here's another thing, if you're thinking about starting a business, 
um, when I, when I went into the place that I went into that we're at now, I had to think like, how much money am I willing to sink into this? Because in a few years, I'm hopefully going to move into something even bigger. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense for me to sink like 20 or 30 grand into this place when I'm going to move into another place, hopefully in the next few years. So you gotta, you gotta also look, look ahead, I'd say five years and, and realize that, uh, you know, hopefully you're going to aim higher and have hundreds of students and you want to have a bigger space. So, you know, sinking in tons of money to have like crazy murals on the walls and, and, uh, extra fancy things at your startup gym might not be the most yeah. cost effective way. It might make your space really cool for the time being, but that money could probably be used somewhere else yeah. in the next five to 10 years. And and similarly related to that, you know, you're talking about making a lot of investments into your, your first, uh, your first gym. Also signing a long-term lease can have pros and cons, right? It can yeah. be beneficial because it can lock you down at a lower cost um, or prevent rent increases, but it can also be a con because it means that when you're ready to grow and expand out of the gym, you might not be able to. Now, now that said, in some situations, if you can't get out of the sub-lease. lease, you can sublease, yeah. but you got to make sure that your lease actually allows you to do that. If, yeah. if your lease does not allow you to sublease it, then you're really stuck there. Yeah. Um, a big part of this too also comes down to where you live because in some cities, the there might be so much space that it's so affordable that you might as well just buy or you know rent out a big place to begin with or you might even be able to buy one depending on where you are. But in a more expensive city, odds are you're probably going to have to start in a like in a closet basically and then you're going to have to grow from there whereas if you're you know if you're in an area that's much more spacious or less populated you might be able to just like actually buy a facility straight out right as opposed to leasing or renting yeah and and with jujitsu growing in popularity you've got to think this way if there's people that are looking to join a gym they could go to a gracie baja or or whatever and and see that it's a big big space there's equipment there's tons of students and then there's you starting up your business in a closet and think what sets you apart from them like what really play to your strengths if you're if you're in that position and realize like okay why would someone want to come train with me at a place that's smaller and um you know like you said a closet or they could go to a like a like a you know a a puppy mill type place like GB where they're going to, they're going to bring you in there. You're going to get all the, all the GB gear and you're going to have training partners at your disposal, right? Like what, what sets you apart? And that's, that's really something you got to ask yourself if, uh, if you want to be a gym owner. And yeah, especially um, because you got to bear in mind too, when you, when someone comes in for the first time, like Matt said, there may not be any other students for them to train with. So at that point, what do you have, right? Um, that's, you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a strategy that you've really got to think about is that, you know, people could be shopping around. There are going to be established gyms that are much more presentable. Um, and there are going to be teams that are much larger. So you have to find a way to provide value that those other guys can't. And there are advantages to being small and nimble. You just need to figure out what those are and, and how they apply to you. But something actually matters that you brought up, uh, which is an interesting example, is affiliation. I mean, this is always an option for a lot of people. You know, most major gyms do allow you to affiliate. Um, There's a very good chance that the instructor you train under probably is already affiliated with someone and you may be interested in taking on that affiliation. Uh, Matt, I know that you don't have so much experience with kind of like the big brands when it comes to Mm -hmm. jujitsu, but what are your thoughts on that? Like, what are the pros and cons of adopting an affiliation? Well, pros are going to be, you know, like, let's say, let's take GB, for example, since we're kicking the piss out of them this whole podcast. If you, if you take GB, for example, you're going to have the name Gracie in your, in your gym name. You're going to have the logo that's somewhat recognizable to the layman. Um, people are just going to come to you because of that. Uh, a con or sorry, a pro is, is that you, you will almost already have be, it's, it's like buying a franchise, right? You already will have almost a, a they'll help you build your business. They'll help you uh, maintain leads and generate it like uh, help you manage attendance. They'll help you sell their gear. Um, and then the cons on that aspect is it'll never really be your gym. It will be a gym where you have to follow rules of head GB uh, headquarters. You have to sell their like on, on the cons. You have to sell their equipment. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to the students have to 
where that um, I don't want to use the word cult, but it, you do the students will have to buy into that team mentality. Got to protect that red shield. You got to protect the red shield, and uh, and you you the lack of you will have a somewhat of a lack of freedom from what you want to teach, right? And there are just straight up affiliation fees is a big part of it. Right? Affiliation fees, of course. Some some affiliations don't cost that much. Some can be quite costly, and you know you got to bring uh, cer- certain black belts up several times a year. You got to fly them in. So I, I've heard both sides of the story i know people that are affiliated that in uh that enjoy the affiliation and i've heard other people that really don't like it because of the said um boundaries and uh requirements that are involved so uh, i'm in a really lucky situation that i'm you know i'm under professor rob he's under kyotera but i'm not i'm not officially affiliated with kyotera although i love i love to represent him and 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 give him the the credit that he deserves but at the same time you know i'm i'm basically uh, an independent gym and uh i will say from from a freedom aspect and just the ability to do what i want to do sell the gear i want to sell it's amazing uh you you know i'm no, no one tells me i have have to do anything i don't have to sell anything i don't have to uh bring people up for for seminars and whatnot um but it probably didn't grow as fast as if i was a gb right if i was a gb i'd probably have way more students uh and and have other benefits as well in terms of how they structure their kids programs how they do their marketing um so yeah a few pros and cons there yeah uh, you know the other thing too is if you aren't a a black belt or someone with a a massive reputation behind you one of the benefits to associating with an affiliation is you can kind of like uh anchor onto them and hitch a ride right they you do have that benefit of having access to very high level black belts who may come up and do a seminar that can help you a lot or just to get your black belt yeah or some people don't have someone to get a black belt that's a big thing if you don't have a professor you may never get a black belt no matter how long you train uh, but in addition to that, if, you know, you if you can hitch a wagon onto someone else, like if, if there is a black belt who you can, you know, you can take under their affiliation, then even if you are not necessarily a black belt yourself, if they're willing to put their stamp of approval on your gym and you can put that on your website and they can at least be around somewhat, that can help you a lot in terms of build, you know, establishing a degree of authority and respect, right? That can be a, a good shortcut to take if you don't have that black belt already. Mm-hmm. I, I I'm not really a big fan of um, like the idea of affiliating with a gym and then if I can look at myself 10 years down the road, like if I have any doubt that I'm, I, I, or, you know, any thought that I want to maybe leave them, I would just never join in the first place because yeah. I think it, I don't really like the idea of joining a, a gym and then, uh, and then breaking my ties with with whoever that may be. For me, I'm I'm so lucky to have a, a mentor like Rob, where like I would never think about training under someone else at this point because the guy's just so awesome and he's such an amazing instructor. He's done so much for me. So it's ba- it, for me, it's truly based on I don't want to use the word loyalty, but it is based on loyalty and friendship. And uh, you know that that's I, I'm I'm under him because I respect him and because he brings out the best in me, not because his brand brings me notoriety it does you know he doesn't bring me uh um you know i'm not using his name to to propel myself it's more because i like the guy and i respect him so much that's why i'm under him yeah yeah i think that if you can get away with it it's probably better not to affiliate if you can avoid it um simply because you're locking your options in right and whenever you're starting up a new business you know you want to maintain as much of that freedom initially as you can uh, if there are benefits to affiliating but generally speaking my suggestion would be if you can go it alone and make that work you're probably going to be happier years down the road yeah and and you know are you a team guy or or are you out for your own interests. Like for me, when, and when I say that, I don't, I'm not referring to your students. I mean, like, do you want to be, do you want to represent GB, which is like a worldwide team, or are you more interested in watching your own business grow? So for me, you know, I, I'm way more into seeing my own business grow than to represent a, a global team. And every tournament I'm wearing their t-shirts and I'm, and you know, it's, it's all about team trophies and things. I don't really care about that, mm-hmm. to be honest. It's more about, it's more about how my business grows, how my students grow. And of course, you know, like my, for when I think about my extended team, it's, it's Rob and then, uh, and then Kyo is down in San Jose. So more about, more about, uh, the freedom and the freedom to do what I want within my own business rather than, uh, like a, a, a big brand. That's just my personal opinion. Nice. 
Cool. So uh, we covered a lot today. We talked about, you know, how to decide that opening a gym is the right decision for you. We talked about the kind of qualifications you might need. We talked about how to determine who you're going to target. We talked about hidden costs that you might need to expect. We talked about how to achieve a path to profitability. And we talked about affiliation. Uh, and, we, and we actually talked a bit about some mental models as well, much to my surprise. We talked about the importance of uh, prioritizing good habits over expecting results immediately. We talked about loss aversion, basically that, you know, it, losses are perceived by humans as being more painful than gains. And so sometimes this can prevent you from taking risks that might actually be beneficial to you. And we talked about uh, having an abundance mindset. So rather than, you know, kind of having a scarcity mindset and being afraid of what you stand to lose, looking for opportunities where everyone can win and everyone can gain. And that is a super important mindset to have if you're going to start up a business. In terms of other things to cover on this episode, we've got a question. This is a kind of a cool one. So we were asked to talk about some of our favorite BJJ competitors, athletes, or public figures that have molded our style or that we otherwise look up to. So there's kind of two sides to this coin. One is, of course, people in the Vancouver area that we'll know that no one listening will know. <laughs> yeah. And then there's people kind of more globally recognized that people will know. Um, mm -hmm. Going for myself uh, at first, you know, the, the people that I know in person, of course, who I've learned a lot from are, you know, with the, I, I kind of came up in a group of guys who have now all gone off around Vancouver and established a ton of successful gyms. So kind of the main people there are like Logan Lidmark, Sophie Zambas, Kabir Bath, um, you know, like Addy, JT, there's a ton of these guys and none of you are going to have any clue who they are. Um, of course, my professor, Don Whitefield, and um, my current instructor, Sean Albrecht, um, these guys were obviously instrumental to my development and Matt, of course. But on top of that, in terms of people who are more globally recognized, I'd say for me, the two biggest people are probably Marcelo Garcia and Emily Kwok. Main reason being, um, from Marcelo's standpoint, just a lot of the stuff that he does has really shaped the kind of strategies that I employ. You know, he, he utilizes a lot of moves and innovated a lot of strategies that are ultra effective for a smaller guy and work in gi and no gi. So a lot of like guillotine and single leg X type stuff that I do, I learned from Marcelo um, and also from Emily Kwok, who took a lot of that from him. So I, I've learned a lot training with her and going to seminars with her. Um, that kind of mentality of how like as a smaller person, you can um, defeat a larger opponent through massive, massive leverage on a single joint has been something that has really been instrumental to me. In terms of like learning models, you know, we talked earlier uh, in a much earlier episode about the art of learning by Josh Waitzkin. And it, there's kind of a pattern here because all of the people I'm talking about are either Marcelo Garcia or people related to Marcelo yeah. Garcia. Um, but his book and his, his way of thinking about learning for martial arts, I found to be super helpful and effective as well. Wow. Very good. So, so talking about people that have influenced us. Well, definitely, Steve. I mean, you're definitely a big influence for me. I remember when I was just getting into jujitsu, you'd beat the shit out of me in our parents' basement. Uh, <laughs> the way that jujitsu was meant to be is like you find like this dingy <laughs> garage or a basement. And... Yeah, I remember you were one of my first jujitsu experiences, so that was amazing. Of course, I was under Don Whitefield before, so I do have to mention him. He's a uh... You know, he was one of the one of the higher level black belts at the time when I was starting in in the Vancouver area. So, I got to mention him as well. Nowadays, um, you know, locally, Rob Bernacki is I I can't I can't mention enough what the guy's done for me. Not only is just from a knowledge point of view in jujitsu, but uh, just the way that I look at jujitsu, the concepts behind it. Or it's, you know, I, I owe so much to Rob. Also, also in terms of running a business, he he really told me to put quality and standards before anything, and and basically, you know if to hell what anyone else says that's really what's valuable is the integrity of jiu-jitsu so i'll always keep that in my heart from him uh if you want to talk about competitors and and uh, international personalities the people that have main in, mainly influenced me are of course marcelo garcia i read his x guard butterfly guard book when i was a blue belt and it forever changed my game um that is probably my favorite jiu-jitsu book to date i would recommend anything from marcelo garcia and obviously his amazing adcc uh, appearances that he's made back in the 2000s um other competitors that are just so influential to me are of course the mendez brothers you know you watch these guys they're always doing new things i'm always you know they're so innovative they got so much material out there we're so lucky that 
we have YouTube and Instagram and so many resources now. So Marce, uh, I love me some Mendez brothers. The Meow brothers are amazing, you know, like really innovating the upside down game as well as the Mendez bros. Those guys really in, uh, help me develop an upside down game. I love watching their styles and uh, God, who else? I mean, Marcelo. Yeah, love I've, love Keenan, but uh, I'm still I still got to get better at my worm guard stuff. But you know, basically, uh, whenever I look at who influences me, I just I I pay attention to the things that I like to do, the positions that I like to do, and then I like to look at the best in the world that who who play those games, and then I try and uh, observe and even mimic those people, and that's where you're gonna see, you're gonna be able to add really great aspects to your game. Um, you know, if I want to do close guard stuff, I'm probably not gonna watch a lot of Mendez Bro stuff. But if I want to learn Barambolos and things like that, I'll, I'll watch the Mendez Bros. Uh, if I want to learn like old school close guard stuff, I'm probably gonna look at like Hodger Gracie and and things like that, right? So. Uh, you can definitely learn something from everyone. Um, and obviously, got to say, Kai Oterra, the guy's amazing. And, of course, Stefan Kesting, who's a Vancouver native and really sort of um, put out jiu-jitsu there for a lot of people in the time when there wasn't a lot of jiu-jitsu to learn. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think the jiu-jitsu community has uh, learned a lot from what he's done. So thank you, Stefan. Yeah, a special thank you to Stefan. I think for a lot of us who have been training for a while, we remember the time when there was not a ton of information on the internet. And Stefan really was the first guy who built a platform that allowed us to get that information, get it easily, and get really detailed quality instructionals. I think most of us probably learned a lot of jiu-jitsu in the early days from watching Stefan. So, and it's so cool that he's part of the Vancouver scene too. Absolutely. And he's done so much, I know, for Rob in terms of uh, doing instructionals with him as well. Um, the guy's done so much for so many people. And, uh, well, I got an instructional coming out with him uh, pretty soon too. So definitely check Funny that. that. Out. What's the name of that instructional? I believe it's called Modern Jiu-Jitsu. And it's all about uh, crab ride, barambolo, rolling back takes, back attacks, things like that. Definitely check it out, guys. You know what's funny is I, I don't really follow the competitive scene a lot. Everyone knows I'm a casual. But I remember the first time someone mentioned the Meow Brothers to me and I thought there is no way that's a real name. There is no way <laughs> there are people out there training jiu-jitsu who are named Meow. But apparently there are. Or Meow. I don't know. <laughs> meow sounds way better. <laughs> if my name were spelled that way, I would insist people pronounce it Meow. Anyway, thanks so much, everyone, for your time. We're going to continue the topic of instructor-related conversations for the next few episodes. I'm thinking the next one will probably expand on this and talk more about once you've started your gym, how do you maintain it and how do you grow it. Thanks again for everyone listening. Thank you for your ongoing and continued support. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, please do share them with us. Thank you very much. Peace.